thank you for that lovely welcome. Um, I know it's it was meant to be a lecture, but I thought it might be uh, easier for us to move through a, a vaster range of subjects if we had a conversation. So what I'm going to do is to just set out a landscape where we kind of complicate this idea of liberty. And first, let me start with, with thanking the women who have brought Noor Inayat Khan to us. You know, uh, I didn't know about her, actually, until I read Shrabani's book quite recently. And um, as Shabani explained, you know, she was, Noor was, was the daughter of a Gujarati Indian Sufi and an American mother. She was born in Moscow. She grew up in Paris, in France. She was a fluent speaker of French as well as English. And when the Germans invaded France, she fled to, to England. So, I mean, the story is, of course, as Shabani said, she, she uh, was airdropped into France after she joined British intelligence to work with the French resistance as a radio operator, was betrayed, was arrested by the Gestapo, tortured, taken to Dachau, and eventually shot. And uh, the story goes that when she was shot, she said, liberty, that was the last word she uttered. Uh, I, I began to think about her, you know, what, what did, if, if it, it is indeed what she said, what did she mean by it? Because she was, Noor was a woman with an untidy identity, but a very clear moral, internal moral architecture. And fascism, underlying fascism is, is a desire for neatness, you know? Including underlying Stalinism was the desire for neatness. And here was this woman with an untidy identity, you know? She was not neat. She was one of those many, many people, many thousands of people who, whose own people were enslaved by the British or by other allies who fought this war. And what did she mean by liberty when she said liberty? You know, I, I, I don't think we'll ever know, but uh, there, was something, there was something so clear and so innocent about that one word at that time. And I just thought to myself, I mean, many of us now who live in places like India, I mean, as we speak, there are friends and comrades of mine, many of them in jail. Places like Bangladesh, people are being incarcerated, Turkey, all over the world. So those of us who are involved in arguing do, do sometimes think to ourselves at night, you know, what kind of a prisoner would I be? You know, how would I react to, to torture or to interrogation because uh, you know, I mean, it's easy for people to say or uh, uh, applaud you as a brave person. I don't know really if I'm a brave person. You know, I don't think I have been tested enough to easily call myself that. So uh, I just thought, but if I had to say liberty, what would I mean by it? You know, is it such a simple word now? So I just thought, let me just, let me just talk about a few things. Uh, to complicate this idea of liberty. I mean, initially I, I, I thought, oh, so the school of Oriental and African studies, maybe we should have a SOAS in India too called the school of Occidental and American studies, <laughs> perhaps, <laughs> you know. But, uh, um, so I, I'll start talking from around the time the Second World War ended, which was also around the time that India became, quote unquote, independent. The post-colonial era 
where one must ask whether colonialism is really post, you know? Is, is, is this something we can say so easily, post-colonialism? Um, with Indian independence came what is known as the violence of partition, the, the million people that were killed in the, in, in the violence between Hindus and Muslims. So, so being a writer, you know, I began to think of that word partition too. What does it mean? It suggests that there was a whole that was then partitioned, and in the partitioning came a great deal of violence. But that's not really true. There was no whole, you know? And there was the violence that came from partition as well as a violence that came from a forced assimilation. There were hundreds of independent princely kingdoms that were forcibly assimilated, either by India or by Pakistan. So today, if you do hear the single ringing clear tone of liberty, the cry for liberty, of course, in Urdu or Hindi, Azadi, it comes from Kashmir. And the, the violence of partition and the violence of assimilation has meant that overnight, India the colony turned into India the colonizer. And there hasn't been a day since August 1947 when the Indian army has not been deployed against its own people within its own borders. There has not been a day. And, and, and I'll come to who those people are against whom that army has been deployed, but Mizoram, Nagaland, Manipur, Assam, Punjab, Kashmir, Hyderabad, Junagar, Chhattisgarh, you know, security forces or the armed forces. So you, do, so you do have this one moment where you wonder what does liberty mean in a situation that changed so rapidly and so quickly. Uh, even as we speak, uh, Kashmir is uh, you know, you have people facing down bullets. You have people whose eyes are being shot out by pellets, shouting liberty. You have mass graves. You have thousands of people killed. You have whole populations being profiled as terrorists. And now we have uh, something that a fiction writer would delight in. You know, two days from now, there's going to be an election in Kashmir where nobody knows who the candidates are. That's secret. Most of them are going to be elected unopposed. So it's strange territory, the de most densely occupied military zone in the world. Secondly, what does liberty mean in a society whose engine is caste? Now, you know, I mean, obviously I can talk about this for a long time, but, but if you look, if you just, I mean, most people know about the history of India's freedom struggle from watching Richard Attenborough's film, Gandhi. And uh, I always uh, wished that somehow on the front of that film, they would just say, this is a work of fiction. <laughs> because, you know, it, it is a falsification of a kind which is pretty unforgivable, you know. And uh, uh, anyway, I won't get into it very deeply, but the debate between Gandhi and Dr. Ambedkar, who was uh, in many ways the person who wrote and was the most political representative of the community of Dalits who were then called untouchables, uh, will tell you the complications of even that freedom struggle. So, uh, for Dr. Ambedkar, Hinduism was a form of colonialism in many ways more terrifying than British colonialism. It was a form of enslavement. Uh, today, there are many young scholars who will talk about how Hinduism, in a way, is, is a way of making history into mythology and mythology into history. You have a young Dalit leader in Uttar Pradesh today who calls himself Ravan. Ravan is the demon king in the Ramayana, who uh, Hindus burn to, to mark the triumph of good over evil. 
But for many indigenous people, for many Dalits, their gods, their kings, their people were demonized in this form of myth-making. So, so the question of colonialism again is deepened. And today, if you look at India, it is a society which, which functions entirely along the lines of caste. I mean, to put it quite simply, if you look at all the owners of the huge Indian corporations, whether it's Reliance or Adani's or so on, they all belong to the same sort of trader caste, Maradi, Baniyaje, Gandhi's caste. If you look at who are the municipal sweepers, 99.9% .9 belong to the Valmiki community. And if you look at who are the editors, who are the judges, who are the accountants, it all breaks down. The modern India breaks down into caste so easily. So what does liberty mean there, you know? Uh, 70 years after independence, actually India is not ruled by a political party. India is ruled by a political party that is ruled by an organization called the RSS, the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, which is a fascist organization born in 1925, that always believed that uh, India should be declared officially a Hindu nation. So one of the debates between Gandhi and Ambedkar that was fascinating, and one of the different ways in which they looked at things, was Gandhi belonging to an upper caste, intrinsically longed for the village republic, intrinsically longed for the, for the rule of the benign people, whereas Ambedkar suspected society. You know? Ambedkar suspected Hindu society. Ambedkar worried about being ruled by upper caste Hindus. So Ambedkar, for him, liberation meant trying to draft a constitution that was far ahead of its time than society itself. Ambedkar is not willing to just leave it to the people. Ambedkar is not willing to, to believe in this old notion of this wonderful India because he was a man who didn't have to go all the way to South Africa to find injustice. <laughs> he didn't, you know. And, um, so today, so today now we are faced with, with the rule of the RSS. The RSS is by far the most powerful society. I mean, the most powerful organization in India. It's an organization whose ideologues have openly said that its enemies are Christians, Muslims, and communists. It's an organization that has openly declared that it wishes to change the Indian constitution, which which, whose opening lines are that India is a socialist, secular republic, to turn it into a Hindu nation. All the members of the BJP, the prime minister, most of the senior ministers, all of them belong to the RSS. Uh, RSS ideologues have often written about how they believe that the Muslims of India are like the Jews of Germany. And uh, it is an organization that has moved to power since 1925 on the wheels of, uh, of hatred, on the wheels of creating a, a kind of drip feed of divisiveness, on the wheels of believing that India, the, the, the vision for India is Hindu, Hindi, Hindustan the land of the Hindus, the main language should be Hindi and Hindusan. I mean, the irony, of course, is that these are all Persian words, <laughs> you know, but anyway. And um, so, so in the coming to power of this organization, you are, you are seeing a country which is actually a country of minorities, which is actually a country where no, nobody can claim to belong to a majority because of the breakdown of caste, of ethnicity, of religion, of tribe. But since the turn of the century, they have been trying to create this Hindu majority. And the creation of that majority 
and the who is to be assimilated into it and who is to be expunged creates a violence in itself. So, uh, I mean, I did a lecture last year where I said, if a novel can have an enemy, then the enemy of my novels is the idea of Hindu, Hindi, Hindustan. But, but so what we are living through now is, I don't know, maybe you could call it history as fake news, you know? So there's a sort of um, the Hinduization, the corporatization of education, of history, which all of you are going through in different ways now, you know? So what does liberty mean then? Where, to me, the most dangerous thing is when, when what young people are being put through before they have even learned how to think is so twisted. When educational institutions like the ones in America privatized to the point where the, the pension funds are now used to fund uh, private prisons, when the pedagogy is corporatized, when your mind, I mean, minds are incarcerated before they even learn how to think, what do we mean by liberty then? Um, what does liberty mean, liberty mean for love in these times, you know? Uh, a lot of publicity, good publicity happened when the Supreme Court in India decriminalized um, same-sex love. And that was a great thing, but at the same time, we live in a society where, where if young people marry across caste or across religion, their own families behead them, mobs behead them, lynch them, kill them, where you're actually being told what you can eat, what you can't eat, who you can marry, who you can look at. Dalits are being lynched because they dared to ride a horse. A man was scalped because, a Dalit man was scalped because he dared to wear a turban. Of course, Muslims are lynched almost every day, you read it in the papers now. All forms of mob justice are taking place. So what would we mean by liberty then? Um, what, does it, what does liberty mean in the era of permanent electronic surveillance, in the era of Facebook, in the era of telling the intelligence agencies voluntarily sur surrendering all our information to them, you know? What does it mean when we know that artificial intelligence is going to result in the loss of masses of jobs? We are going to be a surplus population who has to be controlled. And many things are being put into place in order to control this restive and useless population because we won't be needed to do jobs very soon. In India, we have just uh, initiated the most huge data bank of biometrics in the world waiting to be hacked. So <laughs> what does it mean, you know? When we, if we were to shout liberty, what would we mean? And finally, of course, what does liberty mean to the arts? What does it mean to writers and artists and painters and filmmakers? What does it do to our internal architecture? And how does, how do we function in these times? So I think uh, Shoini is going to really talk much more about that with me, about the idea of literature, of language, of trying to think and trying and, and understanding how to function, not entirely freely, because there can be no entire freedom in a time when people are just being, you know, killed, trolled, lynched, and jailed. I mean, as we speak, there are some of the finest activists in India under house arrest right now. But how do we <coughs> continue to, to think 
<coughs> and work and produce, reproduce the world in some ways. So <coughs> that is something that I guess we're going to speak about now. Thank you. Well, food for thought, I'm sure. Uh, and we're going to continue this, uh, this wonderful conversation that has begun in our heads. Uh, liberty, freedom, happiness, and, and many other things. And I would now like to invite Professor Shoini Ghosh, uh, Professor of Media Studies, documentary filmmaker at Jamia Mila University in, in Delhi. Um, they're going to be speaking for about 40 minutes or so. We will then open the house to questions uh, for about another 20 minutes or so. And then after the 20 minutes question and answer exchange, we will then invite Anandati Roy to read uh, a little excerpt from a book because I'm sure all of you would like to hear that too. So I shall leave you to go ahead now, Shreini. Can you hear me? First, I want to thank the Noor Inayat Khan Foundation and Shrabuni Basu for inviting me to participate in the second edition of the Liberty Series uh, lectures. Uh, I'm uh, very honored to be here. Thank you. And I'm also very, very delighted, always, to speak to my friend Arundhati Roy about her writings. And uh, today, of course, we are going to be talking about freedom uh, broadly. Uh, but I should begin by saying that uh, I got to know Arundhati's writings before I got to know her as a friend. And then as I got to know her as a friend, I had, had no idea what she was writing because uh, she never talks about the fiction that she writes, and she wrote it over 10 years. But while she was writing that fiction, she was also writing a lot of nonfiction. And what originally drew me to her writings, and which is why you know, I had a file of all her articles even before I'd met her, is because she was trying to tell the stories of our lives, uh, because I think that you know, Arundhati is a kind of a fearless witness to the history of the present, but we also know that fearlessness uh, or bearing witness by themselves don't produce good literature. And uh, what interested me was how do you tell the stories about the world that we live in uh, when it becomes more than just telling of the story and when the, the telling of the story becomes as important as the story. And that is also the, the, the challenge of the documentary filmmaker. That is it just the story that you're going to tell or how are you going to tell the story? And I think that this uh, interest that Arundhati has in bringing the art of the novelist into to bear upon the stories of our everyday lives, I think that is not only very, very essential and important, but also under-discussed, I feel. Because what happens is that uh, we tend to talk more about the literariness of Arundhati's writings when we are talking about literary fiction, but not very much when we are actually talking about, uh, uh, you know, her non-fiction essays. And, uh, but I do feel that she does give a lot of thought to how, you know, about how to tell these stories. And, she, and as I said, she brings the novelist skill to bear on, uh, on all that. She's also done, in her nonfiction writing, a lot of work that is missing from the mainstream journalism, for instance. And, uh, I, and what I like about her nonfiction writing is when she brings the writer and the detective together. She's also a very good detective <laughs> because, uh, you know, she will study the material so thoroughly, come up with hard facts and details that others have missed, and then kind of map them into some kind of a story, which is remarkable. Of course, the other part of the detective story is that she's secretive when it comes to writing literary fiction, so we never got to get to know what she is actually doing. So I think that uh, one of the powerful things that Arundhati does with her nonfiction is that she's able to tell these intricate and complex uh, stories, which are also very bewildering for us, you know, all these issues, and she is able to convey them to us uh, in a way that we understand without making it simple, making complex things simple, without making it simplistic. And uh, 
But one of the things that I want to talk about today, when you know you were talking about uh, in the introductory comments that you made, um, you know, uh, you you talked about all the issues that you write about. But I think what is very fascinating is how you write about those issues. And uh, just to go back to this idea about the form that she uses to write either fiction or nonfiction, and. Um, God of Small Things is a text that I use for my students in one of our writing classes. And what is interesting in God of Small Things is that all the important, the, the, the plot twists are revealed to you very early on. Uh, so there are no surprises waiting. For, I mean, there is one surprise, but, you know, but most of the time, you know, you know what it is. But each time you revisit, you get to know, you know, something more. And... Uh, the interesting thing is that there is a description of this kind of writing in the novel itself, which I think kind of uh, describes the novel really well, but also describes what good literature is about. And uh, if I may just read that section, and, uh, and, and here I'm quoting from The God of Small Things, it didn't matter that the story had begun because Kathakali discovered long ago that the secret of great stories is that they have no secrets. The great stories are ones you have heard and want to hear again. The ones that you can, you can enter anywhere and inhabit comfortably. They don't deceive you with thrills and trick endings. They don't surprise you with the unforeseen. They are as familiar as the house you live in. Uh, or the smell of your lover's skin. You know how they end and yet you listen as though you don't. In the way that although you know that one day you will die, you live as though you don't. In the great stories, you know who lives. Either you won't. <laughs> or you won't or don't. <laughs> this is the authorial voice. You know, there, there is a good reason why in cultural studies we say that once the author has written the book, the author is dead. <laughs> But what about when you start reauthoring it? <laughs> like just <laughs> randomly changing words. You know, you know, reading and spectatorship is also <laughs> making meaning. It is, a, it is a kind of authorship. <laughs> but will you let me finish the quote? <laughs> I might. <laughs> In the great stories, you know who lives, who dies, who finds love, who doesn't, and yet you want to know again. And I think that this is actually the, you know, the, the, the wonderful thing about uh, her writing, not just about, you know, not just The God of Small Things, but it's true for, uh, you know, Ministry of Utmost Happiness and also the political kind, uh, essays. So I would like to start our conversation by talking about you, mostly your early life, about the idea of freedom, what did it mean for you? Because one of the things that you did try to indicate in, our, you know, in, in your comments about Noor is that you know, trying to figure out what is this outward fight that she has about, and you talked about, you know, you've coined a beautiful word today about the internal architecture of, uh, what? <laughs> the internal moral architect. <laughs> That's three words. <laughs> Um, a phrase. <laughs> so if you could just tell us a little bit about what your own early uh, fights for freedom were, till you actually became a writer. Well, I think there were, there were you know, um, I'm, I'm always interested in, uh, I think one of the reasons I was interested in Noor was, the, uh, was what I said, these untidy identities, you know, in, in a society which is seeking tidiness. And in India, that tidiness is sought to be imposed mostly by caste. So in my case, I grew up, uh, I mean, I was, I was uh, my mother, my mother's a Syrian Christian from Kerala. She married uh, a Bengali. I was born in, in, in Shillong, which used to be at the, a part of Assam. Uh, then my parents were divorced, and I came back to Kerala. It was, you know, it was, she, she, she arrived in this village, Aymanam, where the God of Small Things is set, which is where I grew up, uh, unwelcomed. And 
I uh, and my brother unwelcomed even more. But we were not at the bottom of the caste system. We were just outside of everything because it was just made very clear to us that you're not going to, you don't belong here. Why don't you go away? You know, that sort of thing. And uh, my, and, and so when I grew up, I, and because it was, I grew up in a village, so it was just, on the river and my friends were the fish and the insects and there was a strange, there was a unique sort of unsupervised childhood in some ways where one wasn't indoctrinated even into the usual kinds of prejudices that one is indoctrinated with, not because uh, of anything but just neglect, you know, <laughs> people neglected to tell me do not like gay people or whatever. I just <laughs> did it. so it was just neglect, and 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 uh, but but to me, growing up as a girl there, I longed to uh, uh, to escape to the city, you know, because the village uh, or the small town where every uh, you know that that marriage, that dowry, that settling down that awaited every woman. First of all, it didn't await me because I was just constantly told no one is going to marry you. And they never asked me whether I was... And this is even before you started writing. <laughs> yeah. So somebody saw the signs really early. <laughs> yeah. So that was the, you know, I used to say I was the worst thing a Syrian Christian girl could be, which was thin and black and clever. They were like, <laughs> get her out of here. So I, I mean, the, the, first, the first urge to freedom was really to leave the village, you know, somehow to, to get away from that. And that was, of course, I'm talking the external things. Internally, I mean, anyone who has read The God of Small Things knows how... You see, for me as a novelist, I've never been able to see these things as so separate. Mm -hmm. You know, those walls are so porous mm -hmm. and uh, the, the kind of... Uh, the kind of uh, rejection and... Uh, cruelty that was imposed on my mother having returned from made, making this bad marriage. Now, I mean, I was the person, uh, me and my brother were the people uh, who she, we were the only people she could take that despair out on, you know. So there was a lot of uh, all that personal stuff going on too. So to flee was my aim in life. Basically, and then you fled to Delhi. You mm. came here. You studied architecture. You wrote a dissertation. You topped your batch, and you wrote film scripts. You know, I'll come to that. But I was just thinking that can we move a little bit ahead and talk about when you started writing? Uh, you know, the different kinds of close encounters that you had with different legal provisions. Um, you know, in the 1990s, a lot was happening in India because, you know, with the economic restructuring, there was the opening of the skies and, you know, satellite television had arrived. And there was a huge moral panic about uh, that, you know, Indian culture is now going to get corrupted because all these Western and terrible ideas are coming in. And uh, the Hindi film song became the number one villain. So even the National Human Rights Commission identified uh, the Hindi film song as the greatest danger that there was. And of course, there's this whole, you know, thing about obscenity and vulgarity, and and the Hindu supremacist groups were leading that kind of fight. But it's very important to know that even the people on the left and feminists were participating in it, you know, demanding censorship at various points in time. And then in '98, there was a huge, big debate around the film Fire by Deepa Mehta about two lesbians in India, and the film had actually being passed without any cuts and it was you know it played in the halls for about two weeks with no problems at all and then the mob started attacking uh, you know uh, the film and after that there was a kind of a realignment of forces and feminists realized that you know once you start using the weapon of censorship something that you want for yourself is going to get censored now around that time god of small things also got into some tangle and after that uh, 
Arundhati has not only, uh, you know, attracted trolling and uh, all kinds of, you know, the, you know, the mobs, but also certain kinds of legal provisions, like contempt of court, for instance, you know, and uh, twice invoked against you, and then I think once sent to jail for a day, uh, you know, and, and some penalty, and then nearly kind of getting charged with sedition. So I was just thinking that could you just tell us a little bit about your close brush with legal provisions? Well, it seems like a sort of uh, cycle that happens to me. Every few years, uh, about five male <laughs> lawyers get together and file a criminal case against me. <laughs> so the first one was with the God of Small Things. I was, I was uh, you know, they filed a case uh, against me for obscenity and corrupting public morality. And I wanted to file a, a, an appeal saying, shouldn't it be further corrupting public morality? <laughs> I mean, like, was public morality pure till I came along? <laughs> but but um, it, it, was, it was a criminal case, you know, and the only thing that was submitted in the court was the last chapter of the book. So clearly, and, and, and mind you, Kerala is, is the... Uh, you know, I mean, if you look at uh, Malayalam cinema or really the center of pornography, and so why they would have been so disturbed by this book was interesting because of the last chapter, which has to do with uh, with a um, with a an upper caste woman and a Dalit man making love, and this was offending their sensibilities. It was the caste issue more than anything else, and it was offending the left as well. Uh, but when the case was filed, just around then, uh, you know, I won the booker. So now they wanted to claim me as well as not claim me. <laughs> they were in a bind. <laughs> yeah. So there was this attempt to sort of make out, oh, this is a book about children or something. <laughs> and I, I was in court uh, the lawyers were ready to argue on both sides and the judge came and he said, every time this case comes before me, I get chest pains. <laughs> and he just sort of... Then the second time, the second uh, case for contempt, it was after The God of Small Things and I, I wrote this essay called The Greater Common Good and it was about the building of big dams on the Narmada River. And... <clears throat> It, was, it went on for a while, but initially they took offense at the fact... I was talking about displacement uh, of indigenous people from their lands, and, and I said that, you know, to pay cash, cash compensation to an indigenous person is like paying a Supreme Court judge his salary in fertilizer bags. And they <clears throat> thought that that was uh, offensive. So they warned me and all that. And then, uh, just a few months later, another group of five lawyers, men, male lawyers, uh, s said that I had tried to kill them outside the gates of the Supreme Court. <laughs> That's so, an extremely believable. <laughs> yeah. So, so I was actually uh, sent notice by, by the court and asked to appear... And uh, I didn't have a lawyer, and uh, essentially, I basically just said, like, don't you have anything better to do? <laughs> and they asked me to apologize. And they kept throwing, uh, throwing my book, The Greater Common Good, from one brother judge to another, and they would only refer to me as that woman. So I began to think of myself as the hooker that won the booker. <laughs> and then, and then uh, they basically uh, wanted me to apologize, and I didn't. So uh, then they said that I wasn't behaving like a reasonable man. <laughs> so it's so all getting very confusing. Anyway, and then I was sent to jail for a day. Um, the next time, it was about uh, yeah. this essay that I wrote called Azadi on, on Kashmir. I was not actually charged with sedition, but there was a lot of was moves were being yeah. made, you know? Yeah, I mean, following this. And then uh, the last, which is 
most recent was a, an essay that I wrote called Professor P.O.W. And it's about a professor called Professor Sai Baba, who is basically paralyzed from his waist down. He's a professor of literature who has been sentenced to life imprisonment um, and is serving his sentence in the Nagpur jail. And this was at the time uh, he was arrested. And uh, again, five lawyer, male lawyers, you know, saying that uh, I was trying to influence the course of justice, which I was. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, you know. And the charges were things like, I had said, you know, uh, that the, the police arrived at Professor Sai Baba's house with a warrant signed by a magistrate in Aheri, comma, a small town in the state of Maharashtra. And they think she's calling the judge a small town man. <laughs> and so, you know, just a comma can be like a cr criminal offense. So, uh, but, but I'd like to say, you know, that the thing is that really, uh, I mean, though these sound dire, the, the thing is censorship now has been outsourced to the mob, you know? And you have these various groups who, who sort of simplify their own identities, appoint their own spokespeople, decide their own histories, fake their own histories, and then start burning cinema halls, attacking people, uh, burning books, killing people. Uh, so, you know, the state has sort of moved out of the way of censorship, and now it's the rule of the mob. And this is more terrifying than being hauled up for contempt of court or going to jail or arguing your case, because you just don't know who is uh, deciding what the correct history should be, what the correct representation should be, what the correct identity should be, or what the only identity should be. So for me, uh, I, I, I feel that militant desire to complicate these simplifications, you know? Which actually, uh, you know, kind of brings me to the next question of, uh, that I wanted to ask you, which has to do with a different kind of you know, liberating yourself from us, different kinds of constraints. In your case, I'm talking about the literary constraints, you know, because um, you wrote this really wonderful essay that you presented in this very city, right? Uh, what is the morally appropriate language in which to write and think? In which you talk about how at some point in life, and you were writing the screenplays that, you know, Shrabani talked about, uh, you felt that you didn't want to write, you know, scene one and, you know, exterior, river, etc. But you felt that you had a need to write differently, you know, you know, talk about, you know, talk about things in excess. And then when you did come out with a second literary fiction, which is Ministry of Utmost Happiness, it didn't bear any resemblance to God of Small Things except, you know, in the inner layers of it. So I was wondering whether you could talk about how you managed to free yourself from different kinds of literary conventions that you have set up and then move away from them and what that does for you. Well, I think, you know, um, I've never been somebody who, who believed in having a profession, you know, or even being a professional writer or like you write a novel, then you have to write another and another and another. So I, so, so, uh, of course I, I trained as an architect and it, uh, when I began to look at the city and how it came to be what it is and think about the city, even when I was studying architecture, the architecture thesis the college mandated that the architecture thesis had to be a building or a housing complex or a hospital or a cinema hall. <laughs> and I said, no, I want to do a written thesis. You know, so that was a, a, a freeing yourself from what is being imposed on you, like they're trying to tell you how to think, how to express yourself and so on. When I wrote The God of Small Things, obviously, you know, it became this sort of moment in which you're, you're just shot out of your own life. And uh, fame is a kind of in, incarceration too, you know? And everyone expects you to write the son of the god of small things or the 
uh, you know, a lot of small things too. And to use that uh, same language, and for me, that was exactly the time when, you know, India took a sharp turn to the right, the nuclear tests happened, and I was being obviously marketed as the poster girl of this new aggressive rising India, and I didn't want to be that person. And I, so the private language of the God of Small Things turned into, an, into a very public argument when I started to write about the nuclear tests, the greater common good. I remember telling myself at that point, you know, okay, so you've written a book about childhood, about love, about, you know, um, about violence. You've written an essay about nuclear tests. Now, try writing about irrigation, baby. You know, see if you can use those skills to, to make people understand. Because to me, one of the most profound political understandings that came to me was the understanding of the, the battle in the Narmada Valley and what it means and so on. And then uh, after a point, um, you know, every time you, 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 you make a new field and then you expect it to stay there, but then you want to move and change. And when I wrote the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, it was, I, I needed a new language. Mm-hmm. And I needed to take, uh, I think I said that in the Zeba lecture I did in the British Library, that I, I, I took the language of the God of Small Things I nudged it off a very tall building. And I went down and collected the shattered pieces because the ministry required a different language. So it's always a form of liberation that you seek, you know, because there's always that, that impetus that requires you to, uh, you know, it requires you to, reproduce the same thing again. And uh, that doesn't interest me. You know? And also you chose a form that you felt was you know, suitable for the, the kind of issues that you were raising because Ministry of Utmost Happiness is a very different book from God of Small Things. Well, more, more than, I mean, I don't, I don't think of fiction as... Uh, issue based you know so it wasn't that i wanted to raise issues but for me the ministry was also more like how can you challenge the idea of the form of the novel itself you know and i wanted to look at the city uh, the story as a city and and a, a, a city that is planned and unplanned controlled and uncontrolled not just this epic story which is played out through the lives of a family or something. Right. So the the canvas is broader. But one of the things that you said right now is that, you know, when you think about fiction, you think very differently than when you write, uh, you know, an essay. And I don't know whether I'm quoting you exactly. I'm not not very careful. Um, (laughs) Good. (laughs) you, You said something about how fiction writing dances out of you and... Uh, non-fiction has to be wrenched out of you. Uh, have you disclaimed that <laughs> intention? Or? I haven't. I was just well. Just to finish my question, is that what is it that fiction writing affords you that non-fiction doesn't? Well, I think. Um, I, I mean, I would say that <laughs> in my DNA, I'm a fiction writer. Yeah. You know, and of course. I always wonder why people think that there's some there's some sort of bipolarity between fiction and fact. That's not true, you know. Fiction is truth. I would say, particularly in the era of fake news, there's nothing truer than fiction, you know. But um, uh, what what I mean, the non uh, nonfiction for me these last twenty years of writing. They were not planned. I, they were always uh, interventions in a situation that was closing down. There was always an argument, you know, a plea to look at something differently in a very, in a time when things were becoming dangerous for people, you know. Whereas fiction, 
Fiction for me uh, uh, is is the construction of a universe. You know, the fiction is is the most beautiful thing that I can possibly imagine doing because it's like uh, inviting a loved one to walk with you through this world that you've tried to construct. It's not an argument, mm -hmm. you know. It's a complication. Mm -hmm. It's a... Uh, it's 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 something uh, which is the opposite of urgent, the opposite of timely. Mm -hmm. You know, it's timeless, or it should be. Yeah, and you've also kind of uh, uh, compared right your writing fiction to slow cooking. Yeah, it's 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 also it also allows you. I mean, nowadays, you know, the world is becoming so so harsh and rigid and reactive and twittery and, you know, and fiction allows you to be naughty, to be whimsical, to be, uh, you know, to, to, it gives you that bandwidth which, uh, which is, 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 I think, uh, getting lost to us in some ways. So, yeah, fiction, I mean, surely when I started writing The Ministry of Utmost Happiness, it was, to me, it's a book where actually, um, you know, the Jannat guest house and funeral services, it, 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 you know, it ends on this, this person, Anjum, who runs a guest house and a graveyard simultaneously. And it... It gives me great comfort, that place. And the characters in the Ministry of Utmost Happiness who began to literally drop in on me and lived with me for 10 years and directed my life in some ways uh, are and became more real than real people, you know? And they, they afford me a kind of comfort which, uh, which I don't think I could do without now. And of course, you know, I'm sure many of you here have uh, read uh, The Ministry of Utmost Happiness. And it's a, it's a novel, not just about human beings, but about creatures, about dogs and cats and all kinds of uh, bugs also. And the, one of the interesting things is that, you know, you refer to this, you know, which you used as a kind of a metaphor, this bipolarity, you know, you wanted to break out of that. And in a way, isn't it a little bit you know, true of the characters as well, that in your fiction, they are, you break every kind of binary, you know? In some ways, when you were talking about the untidiness of Noor's, uh, you know, the, you, your characters are like that, you know? There is this guy called Saddam Hussein, who's actually, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, a Dalit, who takes on a Muslim identity because of, you know, something that happens in his life. So people are they have different kinds of identity at different points in time. You know, they're trying to liberate themselves from something and go towards something else. And I was wondering whether, and which makes it very difficult for, to fix any identity about them, like Anjum, for instance. And I was wondering whether you could talk a little bit about that. Well, I think, uh, I mean, I didn't, I don't think I set out to do this as some kind of... Uh, no, this is all post-mortem. It, yeah, it's, it just happens that I look at, I look back at them and I see how, you know, for example, uh, Anjum, who's uh, in India would be called a hijra, which means a body in which a holy soul is trapped. She's born as Aftab in old Delhi, as born as a boy and then becomes Anjum, ends up living in the graveyard. Now, you know, but being a hijra is not her only identity. Like, she's also a Shia. And in fact, in India today, her Muslim identity is a more dangerous one. It is the identity that makes her more vulnerable. And in fact, when she goes to Gujarat, Anjum gets caught up in the 2002 massacre because she's a Shia. But she survives because she's a hijra, you know, because they feel that killing a hijra will bring you bad luck. Saddam Hussein, who, she, who you mentioned, is a, he's a Dalit <coughs> from Haryana whose father is, is, is lynched by a Hindu mob in 
in a little place called Jhajjar, and he converts to Islam, and he calls himself Saddam Hussein. He's a video of the execution of Saddam Hussein in his phone. And Anjum says, you know, this Saddam was a bastard. He says, yeah, no, I want to be a bastard like him. But I want to, he's very <coughs> impressed by how, <coughs> how, how bravely Saddam goes to his death, you know. <coughs> but the other characters, like uh, one of the <coughs> characters I've worked a lot I lived <laughs> very closely with, let's say, is a character who calls himself Garson Hobart, or whose friends call him Garson Hobart because it's the name of a character, uh, in, a a character in a play, that, a college play. But he's a kind of satyr, you know, he's half, he's trans in a way, because he's half a human being and half the state. He's a very senior, very sophisticated, self-deprecating, intelligence officer. And he uh, has the, the ability of the state to wait, to, to, to take the great long historical perspective, to be unmoved by the signs of tragedy, you know. Uh, so in, in many ways, the Musa, who's a Kashmiri, who has a national border running through him. So you have, you know, in this country which lives in the grid of caste and ethnicity and religion, not even a grid, a mesh, you have almost all the characters with these borders running through them. And through that, you illuminate the grid. Yeah. Uh well, I have a little thesis about the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, which is that, um, and this is my mandatory reference to 377, is that it's, a, it's also a very queer book. Uh, not because it has a trans or a genderqueer person at the center of it, but I think that the, the queer idea of passing is actually very central to the, to the idea of the book. So, you know, uh, that and passing as Saddam Hussein, uh, Gas and Hobart, you know, using this name to pass as somebody else. Musa is constantly passing as the, all kinds of people. And then <clears throat> Anjum, uh, after she has that terrible experience in Gujarat, teaching her daughter, Zainab, her adopted daughter, uh, the Gayatri, Sanskrit Gayatri mantra, so that if there is at a point of communal violence, she can use the Gayatri mantra to protect herself and pass as a Hindu. Comrade Reviti. Yeah, that's true. All the, all all of the characters all the are characters. kind of yeah. passing as something or the mm. other. And also, just to go back to the question of <clears throat> identities, uh, you know, when I was talking about how fluid it is and how it's very difficult to fix somebody, but even, uh, you know, gender sexual identities, which we tend to see as actually, uh, you know, put them in uh, little boxes is also very beautifully done in a way that I will say that I haven't seen that many uh, queer writers write like this, you know, and you will have to wait patiently till I quote Razia from uh, the, <laughs> the first chapter, which is the Khwabwa, the Palace of Dreams, where there's a hijra called Razia. And, uh, you know, she's not, a, she's not actually a hijra, and I just want to quote from that book, and I don't want you to interrupt <coughs> me when I'm reading. Um, <laughs> Dominatrix. <laughs> Razia. <laughs> this was a, that was a queer moment, very spontaneous. I appreciate that. <laughs> so Razia was not a hijra. She was a man who liked to dress in women's clothes. However, she did not want to be thought of as a woman, but a man who wanted to be a woman. She had stopped trying to explain the difference to people, including to hijras, long ago. And I think this is actually quite quite remarkable because what it does is it also talks about the many different aspirations that people have, which then brings me to try and connect the idea of freedom, uh, struggling to liberate yourself from different kinds of things, and actually moving towards happiness. Arundhati, you will agree that we need to talk about happiness today as well. I do have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> like the tone. <laughs> a very threatening tone in which happiness is being claimed. 
and um, in, in, in the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, uh, it's the Jannat Guest House, actually, which is a locus where all the people who, as she says, has fallen off the grid or the mesh, uh, the kinds of misfits who don't fit in anywhere, and it, it, it has an inclusive culture where everybody can walk in, all kinds of anonymous people who didn't fit in anywhere else, and they have. And there is a kind of a, uh, an imagination around happiness over there. I mean, and of course, I, you know, I, I have to reiterate this, that, you know, a writer understands a work in a particular way, the reader may understand it in a different way, and the two coming together might actually result in something. So... In Jannath Guest, in the, I mean, the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, the Jannath Guest House is this locus, you know, where you can have hope. And of course, Arundhati has this beautiful line in another essay where she says that you have to, you know, separate hope from reason. So uh, I think that the people in the Jannath Guest House do that. But there's also some, a, a beautiful, uh, you know, uh, literary sleight of hand that I like to talk about in The God of Small Things, which is that these people who have broken what you call the love laws in the book, that you have this upper caste woman and you have this Dalit man, and they've broken these love laws and they will face the most devastating consequences for that. But because the novel does not actually tell its story chronologically, but moves back and forth in space and time, the novel ends with the lovemaking. It ends in the middle of the story. It ends in the middle of the linear story where, you know, Amu and Velita have made love and they go away saying, promising to meet tomorrow. And we know what the tomorrow is, that it has devastating consequences. And for me, that's a fantastic way to define happiness because happiness is something that we are told should be understood in a durational kind of way, happy forever, you know. And this is claiming a moment of happiness. So looking at happiness as a kind of intensity. And... Uh, I don't think you thought about it exactly like that. I understand that. But uh, I just want to hear <laughs> what your thoughts are on this matter. <laughs> um, well, you know, I think <clears throat> in the case of the God of Small Things, I um, hate to tell you, but I did think about it. Okay. <laughs> That's one but, revolution. <laughs> but <laughs> but the thing thought? is, but the thing is that uh, it was, you know, it it, it really is. Uh, if people say that, you know, the consequences of what happened were terrible, but to me, the fact that it happened at all was wonderful. That is more, the, that is the love making. More wonderful than if everybody had just retreated into safety and maintained the status quo, you know. But uh, in the case of uh, Janet Guesthouse, in the case of uh, people, who, people who have fallen out of this very hard grid of uh, belonging and which is which is you know which is put out in Indian society, and so eventually they live in a graveyard. But actually, if you look at, if you read the book, and if you look at who runs that guest house, who lives in it, who dies in it, and what are the prayers that are being said? You know, I mean, today literally uh, cemet cemeteries are ghettos. You know, not just for the dead, but also for the living, because obviously, uh, you, you, you know, you have graveyards only for Muslims or Christians, since Hindus cremate the dead. And there have been politics over the graveyard and why should they have graveyards and why should they have facilities and so on. So you have this graveyard where, you, you know, when you look at who's buried there, uh, whether it's the other friends of Anjum's or Hijra's, who's saying the prayers, Tilotama's mother's ashes are buried there, Saddam Hussein's father's gets a little grave there in his memory, Comrade Revati uh, from the forest, you know, a gorilla, she's buried there. The prayers are so anarchic, you know. There's the Internationale, there's the Fateha, there's a recitation of Shakespeare. So eventually what you have is a revolution in there, you know? And eventually what you have is 
the idea of solidarity as opposed to because these are people who are who have suffered and who have been beaten down because of their identities or of who they are but their politics is one not of further siloization but of expansion of solidarity of willingness in the in the in this moment in india the willingness to recognize that moment of happiness is so radical you know as a post your choice of sarmat mm-hmm. sheik as being the and sarmat sheik patron saint uh, uh, sarmat sheik is is the patron saint of the ministry of utmost happiness you know and he's uh, if you go to jama masjid there's a little a uh, shrine stuck like a limpet to the side of the big steps of Jama Masjid and Sharma Sheikh was uh, an Armenian Jew who left uh, Armenia in pursuit of the love of his life who was a Hindu boy called Abhechan who was then who then lived naked on the streets of delhi he became a sufi he he gave up judaism took to islam then gave up islam uh, you know said he was searching for the true god and then he was beheaded on the steps of jama masjid but he's like the hazrat of the indeterminate you know the man the saint who stops the circle from closing the to me the idea of the battle against even these new fascisms that are looming is those of us who will not allow that circle to be closed who will not allow any form of neatness who will who will insist on being untidy you know because that's what this world is it's an untidy chaotic world that has to be celebrated as such So now uh, we'll open uh, you know the conversation to the audience uh, if you will just raise your hands and I will you know come to you yes and uh, I will ask, request Smita to tell me when I have to ask you know take the last question so she's going to she's our official timekeeper so uh, I I'll start with you please go ahead yes go ahead uh do we need a mic Okay. Oh, yes. Hi, hi. Um I wanted to ask about um you um in the recent book you wrote about the Gujarat riots, the massacres. And I wanted to know how important was it for you to cover that? Um and is it because it's something that's still suppressed in terms of like I know because of the law court, the law cases and things like that. It hasn't been addressed properly and um, people are still fighting for their stories to come out was that something really important for you to address and then i just wanted to ask quickly as well um you talk a lot about messy identities and did it surprise you from god of small things especially did it surprise you that people in countries that are less um that have less complicated identities that seem to be more unified like places like Denmark or Sweden how much they resonated with that idea of messy identities and how did you feel about that um well i don't i don't know if i need to explain uh, the gujarat massacre at all do i well so in 2002 uh, a massacre of muslims took place in the streets and towns and villages of of the the eastern state of gujarat when the current prime minister narendra modi was the chief minister it was uh there have been many massacres and many worse massacres with greater numbers of people killed in india before so what was the difference between those and this uh one difference was that it happened in the era of television you know or live tv but to me the more important difference was that <clears throat> in the other times while while killings took place there was always the public posture of secularism 
the public aspiration to secularism, even if, even if parties that were involved in the killing, were doing the killing, they still didn't. It was not a stated ideology, you know. Once it becomes part of a stated ideology, you know that trouble is coming your way. And, uh, I mean, if you look back uh, just to the recent history, you know, uh, in fact, how did it happen? In 2001, in September 2001, in, uh, after 9-11, suddenly the world was ready to accept RSS ideology. You know, the Islamophobia in the world <clears throat> meant that there, it was possible for this particular ideology in India, which has been brewing since the 20s, even earlier, to, to take a good step forward. And in fact, Modi was not the chief minister in September. After September happened, he was dropped. The, the BJP chief minister of Gujarat was removed and Modi was put in his place. And within months, uh, the Godra incident happened where a train with Hindu pilgrims in it was burnt. Nobody still knows today who did the burning. And then there was... Um, then the mobs were unleashed. In fact, just Not yesterday, yeah, just yesterday, I think there was an army general who talked yes. about how how the army was told move in, move in, but they arrived in Gujarat and there was no preparation for them. They had they were made to stay in the airport while the riots, I mean we don't call them riots, while the massacre rolled on, you know. Now, the thing is, after that massacre, within, in India, uh, elections and massacres go together. Often, killings are a form of campaigning. And very soon after the massacre, uh, Modi became the elected chief minister before he was just a nominated chief minister. And he won again and again and again. He has never, never apologized for them, you know? And when he became prime minister, there were a lot of even people who think of themselves as liberal, who welcomed him as the new development chief minister. And the massacre, we were told to forget, you know, constantly told to forget. And even today, when the disappointment is setting in, not because of the communal situation, but because of the economic situation, People who celebrated his arrival in 2014 as the prime minister cannot now go back to, 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 to the 2002 massacre because that wouldn't say very much for them. So to me, it was a very central moment, you know. And uh, uh, yes, it's a very important part of the Ministry of Utmost Happiness. Uh, the second question was... Less complicated identities and Denmark being... Ah, well, you know, I, I, I must say, uh, you know, the, the God of Small Things, I think it was translated into 42 languages and the Ministry of Atmosa Happiness in 49. And both these books are so particular, so local, including most of the political essays are too, though some are dealing with 9-11 and imperialism and capitalism and so on. So I actually don't know, and I don't necessarily even want to know what it is about, about, about these stories that, that somehow... Uh, do the opposite work of nuclear weapons, you know. They just jump over these cultural barriers. They, I, I remember being in Estonia and, 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 and someone came to me and said, but that was my childhood, you know. So I think somehow that belief that deep, very, very deep down, you know, beyond all the noisy debates that we are involved with, which are important, we do have to believe that 
that we all love and we all fear and we all laugh uh, in ways that we can recognize each other, you know? On the right, yes, go ahead, yes. Um, firstly, thank you so much um, for this evening. And um, I just wondered, you started this evening talking about the way in which the imposition of a border caused huge violence, both in terms of separation and assimilation. And when you've talked about the Ministry of Utmost Happiness, you've talked about the way in which there are incendiary borders that run through all of the ca characters. And, you, and you've talked quite often this evening about the importance of transgressing borders and boundaries. And I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about the relationship between borders and liberty. Do you mean, uh, do you mean in, in a political sense? Or no. in any sense? In any sense. You were talking about the incendiary boundaries. Uh, you know, borders that run through, through, the, through, the through people. So it's just, mm. just the idea of borders and how hard and fast they are, whether they can be porous and the sort of the political, but also the personal. Well, I, I suppose, you know, um, if, if, if I were to talk politically, you know, peop, uh, right now, today, in India, the... The great accusation that is hurled at anybody who uh, who disagrees with this RSS-centric view of India is that you're an anti-national, you know. And I keep thinking, you know, but uh, all of us somehow evolved from a time way before the nation state existed. You know, so uh, how can you expect me as a writer to only think along those borders? I mean, there was a time when India and Pakistan and Bangladesh were one country, and now you're supposed to, now that it, it's been, you know, partitioned, you're supposed to hate each other, whereas you share so much language and music and poetry. How is it possible, you know? And how are, how are these... Um, how are these emotions being dictated to us in these ways? But on the other hand, there's a, there's a part in the Ministry of Utmost Happiness where Musa, who's, one, who's a Kashmiri character, who eventually, because of the circumstances of Kashmir, is forced underground, you know, and he and actually he and uh, a, a woman character called Tilotama and Garson Ho, but all of them knew each other when they were young. And at one point, many, many years later, Musa shows up in Garson Hobart's flat. Garson Hobart is now a drunk sort of person who's looking back on his life and thinking about Kashmir a lot. And M Musa tells him that, you know, um, you, he, he says, Kashmir will destroy India. You know, because you can blind us, but you still have to look at us, you know. You still have to, to, to deal with what you've done to us. And if you even take that statement literally, you see, you know, there's a time when Kashmiris had the most precious thing to them was their ID. They were just numbers. They couldn't go anywhere without that card. Now, all of India has the UID, you know? Kashmir uh, the, has made the Indian army into a bloated, corrupted administrative force. And meanwhile, the, the insurgencies in India are turning the Indian police into an army. Every institution, you, so once, you, once you're, you're calling yourself a democracy and yet you're able to absorb the kind of cruelty that's being inflicted in your name on a people, the corruption that comes from that is incredible, you know. And it's incredible that the countries that call themselves d democracies, whether it's Israel or America or India, are the ones that are busy running military occupancies, you know? I've been told by the organizers that we have time for uh, two more questions. And I'm going to take one from this row 
and one from there. So I, I'll just come back to you after this. Go ahead, sir. Uh, hello. Uh, I just wanted to ask you. I just wanted to ask you, as a person who so beautifully uses the language of the everyday life in your work as a writer or as an artist or as a citizen, uh, how do you interrogate yourself and ground yourself and keep yourself using that language while entering spaces of um, where uh, entering spaces of institutionalized and corporate spaces of the university, of the workforce, of the nation state in general? And how do you analyze where you can use the language of the everyday life and how that language is influenced by the language of the nation state? Well, I think, you know, language is such a language is language is the thing that is most under attack, you know. Uh, the 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 la the NGOization of language, the nationalization of language, or simply the 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 murder of language. You know, I'll tell you a, a funny story. Many years ago, uh, when I was you know um, writing a lot about water and privatization and the dams, they, there was a big water convention in the Hague, so. I was asked to go, and I don't go because I don't, I don't really go to these kinds of things. But then I heard that there was a big delegation going from India to, to, to basically promote privatization and the building of big dams. And so I just arrived to see how much of it I could wreck, you know. <laughs> so they put me on this panel, and they, they said it was a panel of writers. And they said, everyone has to introduce themselves <coughs> and say why they write about water. So there was an American, uh, you know, privatization, whatever, expert, and he said, uh, I write about water because I'm paid to, and, you know, God gave us the rivers, but he didn't put in the delivery systems, and for this we need private enterprise. His name, you know, you have to say your name, so I said, well, I write about water because I'd be paid a great deal not to. <laughs> You know, and then I said, you know, the thing is that uh, all of you call yourselves writers, but you're not really writers. You're the opposite of writers because writers spend a lifetime trying to close the gap between language and thought. And you spend your lifetime trying to devise a language that masks thought, you know, that every single <laughs> word that you... Every single word that you can destroy, you'll destroy. You know? what, uh, what do you mean by freedom? What do you mean by empowering women? What do you mean by the poor? What do you mean by everything? You mean the opposite of what you say. So whatever else you do, don't call yourself writers. You know? <laughs> Find another name or a word for yourself. But okay. We have one last question there. Go ahead. apologize for my Christian name. My Christian name is Shiva. <laughs> but moving on from that, the, the world recently lost a writer who dedicated his life to the narrative of the untidy life of the society that tries to tidy the untidy life and the inefficiency of the whole process. I still can't find his blue plaque in London. And he was crucified in, in all the obituaries. We know who that writer is. You have dedicated your life, to, it seems, to the art and the narrative of the untidy life. Would you say that the art of writing without a cause is a lost cause? The art of writing without a cause? Well, you see, I, don't, I have never understood what, what a cause is. You know, in that uh, there were, there were uh, you know, to me, 
uh, when I'm writing about, let's say, big dams, or I'm writing about capitalism or privatization, or I'm writing about the attack on the Indian parliament or whatever, none of it is a cause. It's a way of seeing. It's a, a way of understanding and deepening life around you, you know? So a cause is like a charity or something, you know? Like a cause is something that some celebrity endorses. But I, I don't ever see what I do as a cause, as, you know, I somehow I'm not able to isolate these things. Every, like for 20 years, I've written political essays. Most of the time, it's uh, written to explain to myself. And each essay I write deepens my understanding about the next thing. So they are not really separate. They're a way of seeing. So for me, uh, I don't think that there is any piece of writing not uh, uh, that isn't about a way of seeing, you know? However, however fragile or however unobvious it might be, there's a way, everybody has a way of seeing something. Everybody, you know? There's nothing uh, that is neutral or mechanical about, about things. Thank you, Arundhati. That was wonderful. But before we end, you have to ma you have to read something. Yes, <laughs> I have a. And we will end with that. I I, I just thought um, I would read a little. It's just very short, and it's a little bit about. It's it's from uh, it's from the first essay that I wrote after the God of Small Things came out. It was an essay called The End of Imagination, which uh, which was about the nuclear tests. Uh, that uh, the 1998 nuclear tests in India. And um, I mean, not that this part uh, makes that obvious, but it's just something about writing. <laughs> so there's a part in that, uh, in that essay where uh, I meet a friend of mine, an old friend of mine in New York, and she's talking to me about, about success and fame and... Uh, you know, she she basically she's basically telling me that after the 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 huge success and the winning of the Booker Prize, that my the rest of my life was going to be vaguely disappointing to me. <laughs> so, um, so I'll just read this little part. Um, I told my friend that there was no such thing as a perfect story. I said, in any case, hers was an external view of things. This assumption that the, traje the trajectory of a person's happiness, or let's say fulfillment, had peaked and now must trough because she had accidentally stumbled upon success. It was premised on the unimaginative belief that wealth and fame were the mandatory stuff of everybody's dreams. You've lived too long in New York, I told her. There are other worlds, other kinds of dreams. Dreams in which failure is feasible, honorable, sometimes even worth striving for. <clears throat> worlds in which recognition is not the only barometer of brilliance or human worth. There are plenty of warriors that I know and love, people far more valuable than myself, who go to war each day knowing in advance that they will fail. True, they are less successful in the most vulgar sense of the word, but by no means less fulfilled. The only dream worth having, I told her, is to dream that you will live while you're alive and die only when you're dead. Which means exactly what? Arched eyebrows, a little annoyed. I tried to explain, but I didn't do a very good job of it. Sometimes I need to write to think. So I wrote it down for her on a paper napkin. And this is what I wrote. To love, to be loved, to never forget your own insignificance, to never get used to the unspeakable violence and the vulgar disparity of life around you, to seek joy in the saddest places, to pursue beauty to its lair, to never simplify what is complicated 
or complicate what is simple, to respect strength, never power, above all, to watch, to try and understand, to never look away, and never, never to forget. Thank you.